Okay, let's get the show on the road here. Um, this is one of a number of a PowerPoint videos that they are going to be coming sequentially that are concerning uh, osteology. Um, and we're going to do it by regions. And, th and this, this particular one is going to be involving the, sh the shoulder girdle. Okay. Um, the, problem, the thing that we need to think about is a large percentage of the studies that are done radiographically uh, have to do with osteology, have to do with the skeletal system. And I think that it's going to be um, up to you to look at these and understand these quite well because this is your bread and butter okay um, yeah there's chest x-rays and there's abdominal x-rays but but still when we look at the overall number of radiographs that are performed uh, many many of these are musculoskeletal okay so hopefully you'll take some time and look at these and not just brush through them and you'll know every little nook and cranny of every little bone you have there and it's going to be very helpful for you down the future so what we want to talk about in this one is basically the shoulder girdle okay we talked about uh, um, the divisions, okay, uh, and, and, and when we talked about classification of the skeletal system, we talked about the appendicular skeleton, and the appendicular skeleton basically is very convenient because what's on the right side is on the left side unless there's some type of an abnormality or an amputation or something like that, and, you know, it's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a shame. But what, what happens is um, and we, we have two of everything. So we have a, a clavicle. Clavicle means the collarbone. The scapula, the shoulder blade, we have one of each on each side, obviously. Uh, humerus. We're going to talk a little about the humerus today simply because that's going to be involving uh, the shoulder girdle as well when we talk about the shoulder joint. Okay, uh, We have two, the radius, there'll be two of those, the two ulna. Uh, carpals, we have eight in each wrist, so we have 16 altogether. Metacarpals, I have five on each on each hand, five fingers, five metacarpals, okay? So therefore, there's going to be 10 total. And the phalanges, each of the digits, um, uh, the, 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 the index, the middle ring, and little fingers all have three phalanges, and the thumb has has only two, okay? Uh, also, I should have mentioned, and we'll talk about this later, that the, the term for, for thumb is pollux. Pollux. We'll talk about that later on in another uh, presentation when we get to the hand. Anyway, so let's talk about the shoulder girdle. And basically, what we're talking about here is the, the clavicle, the scapula, and the upper portion of the humerus. Uh, let's start with the clavicle. The clavicle is a collarbone, as everybody knows. Uh, it's an S shaped bone, okay? And it, it, the, the, the nice thing about it is what you could do is when you're listening, when I'm talking here and you're watching the video, you can actually feel it because the clavicle is, is very super, uh, subcutaneous. You know, it's it's a very superficial bone on the superior side. So if we could feel it, you know, we could actually follow that whole course of the clavicle all the way from the sternum because it originates at the sternum all the way out to the shoulder to a, a process that originates from the scapula uh, called the acromion. Okay, so it's a uh, we know it's paired. We know it's S-shaped. It starts at the area of the manubrium, which is the part of the sternum, and goes to the acromion. Now. A couple things happen um, on that route from the sternum to the to the to the um, uh, all the way out to the uh, acromion process of the scapula. Um, first thing that happens is it, it changes in shape. Very close to the sternum, the clavicle is almost pyramidal or roundish. Um, and then finally, when we get out to the area of the acromion over the top of the shoulder, the acromion becomes very flat. Okay, so let's look at this first of all. Let's just take this, let's take your finger and see it right here at the base of your neck. Follow your trachea on down and feel right here. There's going to be a little notch right here. Okay, you'll feel a little upside down uh, like a dent here. That's that's called, the, that's that right there is called the jugular notch, the jugular notch. And that's the upper portion of the sternum, which is called the manubrium, the manubrium. It's right there. Now, if you take your fingers and you feel that jugular notch and just go over and slide your fingers both ways, you're going to feel a bump right here and you're going to feel a bump right there. And that is the sternal clavicular joint, the sternoclavicular joint. That's where the clavicle starts from the sternum. You feel it's sort of roundish appearing when you just take your fingers and rub it over the top of it. It's sort of roundish, okay? Simply because, again, at that point, <clears throat> the clavicle is either sort of almost a pyramidal to almost a little bit round type of a type of a bone, okay? What happens then, we could divide the clavicle into thirds, a, a, a medial third, a middle third, and a lateral third, okay? Um, and when we go from that medial third at that sternoclavicular joint, what happens is you could follow the clavicle now, you could follow it along that upper border, okay? And then finally, it starts to curve backwards. 
you see how it's how, how there's an s-shaped curve it starts anteriorly and it curves backwards okay and that happens in that middle third when that starts to happen so we'll talk let me you know and give you a little bit more about about, the, about that in just a second i'll show you show you a diagram anyway so we know that that shaft curves laterally and posteriorly and then about when it gets into the middle portion it actually starts to go posteriorly and laterally okay as it's going that way um, at that point it started to change from a, from a uh, from a pyramidal to a round type of a bone to becoming flatter and flatter and flatter and flatter and flatter until it finally gets to the area of the acromion out here and you'll be able to feel that as well when it gets out to the area of the acromion where it becomes very flat okay that superior surface of the clavicle is subcutaneous that's why you can feel it the whole the whole way through and the bottom of the surface of the uh, bottom surface of the, of the clavicle you can't really feel because it's you know down uh, deep inside and that's a little bit more rough and that's for there's it's there's a couple uh, there's one little bump there that's really significant we'll talk about in, in a second but it's a little rougher because there's attachment of various other types of tissues that are on the bottom side okay the top all you got is the skin over the top of it um i can't tell you working with um uh, i did a lot of work with uh, hockey and lacrosse and you know each each year i had at least one to two clavicular fractures uh that would that would occur and you know I, my son had a clavicular fracture that's a long story i don't want to get into that one <clears throat> right now but um you know it's a, it's a very common thing and frequently you'll be able to feel those quite easily and some of them are actually pretty pretty wild some of these clavicular fractures they're just off off the wall wild okay well hopefully i'll, I'll be able to show you some pictures of those later on so if we look at at the bone and let's start to look at it here okay what we're doing is is if i when we start to start that's this is the sternal end right there and it doesn't really show it very well but again that sternal end is is much rounder and or or, or almost like pyramidal sometimes almost like a like a pear shaped okay and so that's going to be the sternal side the same thing here you just can't see it and so this this right here would be my my medial third this here is my middle third and this here is my lateral third <clears throat> you can see what happens we continue those on down you can see what happens <clears throat> in regards to uh, how it starts to go through that s shape change from both from medial to lateral so it, it, this is the best way to look at it if that, this would be like the uh this right here if we look at it uh is going to be the uh the the, the right right clavicle so th it starts so this would be this would be anterior it says anterior board right here anterior and that's where you could feel it right here right at the area right by the manubrium okay that would be this area of the bone you're feeling right there and then if you, fo you follow it you start to go posteriorly and laterally and that's in this portion right there where it becomes uh, posterior and lateral one thing that I should mention and, and again in this area right here it started becoming from more tubular round pyramidal to becoming flatter and flatter and flatter and flatter and flatter and flatter and flatter, and flatter until it gets out to the acromion when it's actually a relatively flat bone okay other than that the only other really significant bump that we find on it is on the inferior surface it's called the conoid uh, conoid tubercle the conoid tubercle you can see a little bit from the top so like in a little silhouette right there okay Okay. that's called the conoid tubercle and that thing is important okay that little conoid tubercle is 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 exceptionally important let me get rid of all this stuff here and show you again you can see the edge of it right here and you can see where it is right here this would be on the inferior side and you can see a little silhouette when I'm looking down from the top it's it's significant because what happens is right from this there's a ligament that comes straight down and attaches to a little portion of the uh, of the uh, scapula called the coracoid process and I'll show you that when we get to the scapula and that holds the clavicle down okay sometimes people will actually sprain that ligament and the clavicle then is able to fly up and it, it actually we get a dislocation right where the, a clavicle meets the meets what's called the acromion process okay now if I'm looking at this what we're seeing here okay is we're looking at the clavicle and this one right here would be the left this is the left clavicle okay this is the left clavicle right. it's the left clavicle and you can see what happens this is the sternal end right here sternal end right here and this is the acromial end right here so this is sternal this is a chromial end right here so you can see if you're looking from the top you're looking just like we had in the, in the previous pre previous image so this is going to be rounder out in here okay and then it's it's it this is that so we could divide that into thirds again here's here's the medial 
middle, lateral, okay? And you can see how it actually, when it gets to that middle third, it starts to curve posteriorly as it goes laterally. And it starts to widen out and flatten out when we get out here at the area of the acromion, okay? So this would be the acromial end over here. This over here is the sternal end right there, okay? Now, if we look, you could probably see what we were talking about a little bit with that with that conoid process, okay? Again, it's going to be on the on the acromial side, okay? And if we look right here, you see that little silhouette. This is just the opposite from the view from before. You can't see it really well, but this is the area. This is the area right here. You can actually see like look like this area right here. I'll I'll erase that mark so you can actually see. But let me draw it again, okay? Look in the center of that. That's where that conoid uh, uh, tubercle would be. And that's where the ligament is that, that holds the, the clavicle down. It comes from the scapula, okay? This is just a radiograph, and this is something you should be well aware of. This is the sternal end over here, okay? And that's the sternoclavicular joint. So here's my medial, here's my middle, here's the lateral third. Okay, and you can see, and you get, this is a better view, a view of how it starts to change. This is going to be a very round uh, pyramidal out here. And when we finally get to that middle, where it's going and starting to go posterior, you see how it starts to change until I finally get out to the acromial end, and it's, it's very flat. Okay, it's wide. It's going to paddle out a little bit, but it becomes very flat. Okay, now this right here is the acromion process. And that's a part that comes up, and you'll see that a little bit later, later when we talk about the scapula. And that's the acromion process, okay? Now, why is that important, okay? That's important because this area right here, is, uh, it's a chromial clavicular joint. Uh, darn it, I'll show you again. It'll, it'll come up in a little bit. I can't go back with these PowerPoints, which is crazy. Let's talk about the scapula and get that out of the way, and then you'll be able to see this because we'll show some pictures and you'll see the, see the coracoid down, down the road as well. So let's talk a little about the scapula first of all. Okay, and now this this view that we see, this this uh, diagram that we see on the right is actually gonna, going to be, um, well, if, if you see this is the area, this this area right here is where the, where the head of the humerus is going to be. The arm is going to be coming down this way, okay? So basically, this is the left scapula, the left scapula. This is the anterior surface. This is the anterior surface. That's the front of the scapula. That's right against the chest cage, okay? So let's talk and see what we have here. First of all, this area appears the acromion, and this is where the clavicle is going to come and attach to. It's going to attach to that acromion right in here, okay? That's that. Now, right here... Okay, let me just do it this way. This little thing right here, it's a little finger of bone that sticks out, okay? That's called the coracoid process. It's really important. A, a number of things happen to uh, attach there. Now, if you take your shoulder and you can feel the ball portion of the humerus right here, okay? So take, feel, if you, let's, let's do this. First of all, let's try this. Let's just go, follow your clavicle all the way out to the end, okay? And then just before you get to the end of the shoulder, you'll feel either a little bump or like a little ditch or a little gap. And that's where the clavicle ends, and that's called the acromioclavicular joint. If I go lateral, it's still hard, and that area out there is the acromion. That's the acromion. Uh, when people have a dislocated shoulder, yes, it could occur at the at this joint right here, but it's not unusual to have what's called an uh, an uh, acromioclavicular separation. I've seen tons of those. They're very very common. Okay. Now, if I feel the, the humerus right here, okay, what I want, what I want, what you need to do is then just come a little bit medial and not far, not far, and you start to push down and you're going to feel a little bump. If you have to push really deep, it gets really tender. I don't know why I'm hurting myself like that, but it, it's, it's, it's sort of deep right there, and that's the coracoid process, okay? Now, that coracoid process right here, that's the area that has that ligament that comes up right from the coracoid that attaches to the clavicle right here to that conoid process that sits right there. And it holds the clavicle down so the clavicle doesn't go up. We want that clavicle to meet the area of the acromion. We don't want it to be above. And that little ligament, which is 
you know, which is which is called the coracoclavicular ligament, by the way. You know, coracle because coracoid, clavicular, clavicle. It's, it comes right from the from the coracoid process to that area of the of the a conoid tubercle on the inferior surface of the clavicle. Okay, if you don't remember that, go back, go back up the video, and you can see exactly where that is. Okay, so that's called the coracoid process. That coracoid process is so it it has that uh, uh, coracoclavicular ligament okay that's just an abbreviation okay but also has three muscles that attach there okay and we'll talk about their three muscles that attach the coracoid okay um and you don't have to remember them now but later on one of them is is, is called the coracobrachialis and that's going to be easy why coracobrachialis go figure that okay the second one's called the short head of the biceps the biceps actually has two heads has two tendons and one of, them's, one of them goes to the area of the coracoid process the third muscle that attaches to the area of the coracoid process is the pectoralis minor pectoralis minor we'll talk more about that when we talk about the muscle okay so anyway that's a little bit in regards to where we are okay so again let me get rid of this stuff so we could talk about the other stuff that's on this particular slide okay so again, so when we talk about uh, when we when we look at this, this is the lateral side. There's the lateral border. There's the medial border over here. The vertebrae would be right in here, and the arm would be out here. Okay, just to orient you where you're at. Okay, um, this up here, for lack of any better purpose, is the superior border or superior superior border, and this area right here is a superior angle. Okay, makes sense. Superior means at the top so the superior the top edge is called the superior border top angle up there is called the superior angle okay we don't see the spine don't worry about the spine yet that's going to be coming up in just a minute okay are uh, the scapular notch when notch is like a little cutout area well there it is right there there's the scapular notch sits right there at the very top of the scapula things again what goes through it some some you know structures will go through it nerves and arteries and stuff like that so that's called the scapular notch okay um you don't worry about this the super uh, uh spinous fossa it's not there but however if you look at this area right here if you look at this area right here it's actually hollowed out a little bit if we actually had a bone I'd be able to show you it's, it's mildly concave from here to here like it's mildly concave this whole if I took this by the way if I took the scap and held it up to the light you actually see the light almost like uh, illuminate through it okay it's sort of uh, I can't say it, it's it's sort of like translucent so it's very very thin and this area in the middle is exceptionally thin however what happens is this whole area in here is filled with a muscle and that muscle is called the subscapularis 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 and the subscapularis um, is is an important muscle because it internally rotates the arm it's an important muscle for pitchers or th for throwers subscapularis because it internally rotates the arm it goes to the front attaches to the front of the humerus up in this area okay and that's called the subscapularis and, and fills that whole area it's a very very thick very dense muscle that fills that area okay so that's what we have so again we know where the acromion is acromion is out here the coracoid process is this thing right here I can't even see anything anymore okay get rid of all that just so we could look at it again okay so here's the acromion process here's the coracoid process superior border superior angle okay scapular notch sitting right there this in here is the subscapular fossa subscapular fossa because we know fossa is a depression that would be in that and that's for the subscapularis muscle okay we don't see the spine and we don't see the supraspinous fossa yet okay that comes for next now we can see that let's get rid of all these drawings okay let's get rid of all this stuff in here okay and this makes sense okay now we're talking posterior this is the posterior aspect of the scapula okay let me orient you exactly where you are on this side here's the medial border so what happens is the vertebrae are going to be right here vertebrae going to be right here arm is going to be out here okay everybody with me what happens is the most prominent thing on the posterior scapula is this thing right here okay and that's called the subscapular spine the scapular spine okay and it's actually really prominent and if you take if you have a friend you know and you pay him 
quarter, 50 cents, whatever. It depends on, on what their going rate is. If you feel the scapula, you'll actually feel that little spine that's up along the back. I can, I can feel mine right here. It is right. It's it, it's running from 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 inferior medial to a little bit more towards superior lateral, and it ends at this thing right here, which is the acromion process. It ends at the acromion process. Okay. What that does is it creates two other fossas in the back. Okay. This one up in here is called the supraspinous fossa. Supra means above, and it's, uh, what's it above? It's above the spine, so they call that the supraspinous fossa. There's also one down here that's below, inferior to, which is called the infra spinous fossa. Okay. Now these are important. This one up in here, the supraspinous fossa, sometimes also called also called the supraspinatus fossa has a muscle in that and that muscle in there is called the supraspinatus muscle the supraspinatus muscle and that comes fills this whole area up in here and runs underneath the acromion okay and attaches the top of the top of the humerus right up in there and I'll show you when we get to the humerus, humerus where it attaches to so that's called the supraspinatus muscle and the supraspinous fossa guess what runs in this infraspinous fossa another muscle called the infraspinatus infraspinatus and that one actually attaches to the back side you know to, or to the lateral most side of the head of the humerus okay back in here and I'll show you exactly when we when we look at the head of the humerus okay now also right from this area down here at the inferior angle this one here is called the inferior angle uh, right from the inferior angle that's almost it's really sort of almost attached to the infraspinatus muscle there's another muscle that comes up there and it's called the teres minor Terry's minor muscle. Now, I want to remember those four muscles for a specific reason. We had their subscapularis, subscapularis. I apologize for the writing for some reason. That, that, you can't write too well on these screens. And that's the one on, on that anterior side that we saw in the, in the last image, okay? Then we had our supraspinatus, supraspinatus. Then we, which is that one up in here, okay? If we look up in here, it's this one up in here. We have our infraspinatus. Which is basically one sits down in here. And then I have my teres. Ah, oh, darn it. I should have done that in red. That's okay. Teres minor. Two words. And that's down here. So that would be down in this area. I'll do that one dark blue down in this area right here. The reason why those four muscles are important, those muscles are called the rotator cuff. So when you hear somebody talk about a rotator cuff injury, it's one of those mus muscles, usually either the supraspinatus or the subscapularis or the supraspinatus. Both those two are the ones that are most common. Okay. They're called the rotator cuff muscles. You know why they're called the rotator cuff muscles? That's right, because they rotate the shoulder. They're the ones that are involved in this type of motion of the shoulder when they rotate the shoulder. Okay, the, the subscapularis rotates the shoulder in this way. The supraspinatus actually lifts the shoulder up this way, and the infraspinatus and teres minor rotate the shoulder outwards or laterally, backwards. Okay, so those are the and, and so I have my my super uh, supraspinatus that's in the suprascapular fossa. I have my infraspinatus in the infrascapular fossa uh, or infraspinatus fossa, excuse me, and then I have my teres minor that's attached here, subscapularis on the other side, like we talked about. OK, uh, let's look at now from a different point of view. Let's look at it a little bit more from the from I'm looking from lateral to medial. OK, and what happens is this area right here. OK, that's called the glenoid cavity or the glenoid fossa. And that's that socket. It's and it's, it's funny because the, the head of the humerus is very round, but uh, that the amount of um, a roundness of that glenoid fossa isn't a whole lot. It's 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 mildly concave, but. There's always a kicker. There's always something else. If you look around this, around this, this glenoid fossa, see this rim around there? there? There's a rim of cartilage, just like the meniscus in the knee. There's a rim of cartilage that goes around the side. And that rim of cartilage that's around the outside is called the labrum. L-A-B-R-I-U-M. Labrum. Or L-A-B-I-U-M, excuse me. 
I'm, I can't spell what I'm trying to spell. Labrum, okay? It's called the glenoid labrum, L-A-B-R-U-M, okay? Uh, and what happens is that deepens the shoulder socket. So in other words, the head of the humerus is a deeper socket in which to hit, in which to, to fit into. A lot of times pitchers, one of the problems that they get with a the pitcher is they actually will um, uh, uh, wear out the edges of that glenoid labrum, okay? And when they wear out the, the edges of the glenoid labrum, then all of a sudden the shoulder becomes unstable. There's a lot of pain when they throw and they have to replace that. Or if somebody's had a dislocated shoulder, the, the shoulder usually goes anterior and down goes forward and down. So this would be anterior. Okay, if I'm looking at where the scap is, this is anterior, this is posterior. The head of the humerus should be sitting right here. The head of the humerus then sits down in here. And when it comes, it actually rips part of that labrum that's right there, okay? So anyway, that, that socket that we have around the shoulder is called the glenoid cavity, and it's made deeper by a ring of cartilage. It's only around the outside, and it's called the glenoid labrum, okay? The infraspinous fossa, we talked about that a little bit before, and the infraspinous fossa is again that area right there here's my inferior angle uh, again this is going to be my medial uh, my lateral border this is my medial border medial border here lateral border over here and the subscapular fossa would be this area in here okay subscapular fossa is this right there okay so pretty much what we what we talked about a little bit before. This is just looking at um, uh, real bones, okay? And if I look at that, I can see exactly what we saw here. What, 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 I mean, I'll point everything out, out to you. First of all, this is the glenoid fossa right there. You can see it. See how it's, how it's not really deep. It's relatively, it's only mildly concave, mildly concave, okay? So this is lateral, okay? Because the head of the humerus is sitting over here. This is medial over here. Here's that inferior angle. Here's that superior angle. Here's the superior border, okay? This in here, because it's anterior, okay? So this is an anterior view, okay? This is that subscapular, subscapular fossa, and that's where that subscapularis muscle sits in this area. Here we go, and you can see the coracoid process, and it's a beautiful coracoid. That looks really, really nice, okay? And you can see where that coracoid process is. Here's that little scapular notch, let me do it in a different color so you can actually see the scapula notch. Scapula notch is sitting right in there, okay? And our good old friend, the acromion, sits up in the top. Where's that? That's an extension of that scapular spine, okay? So let's slip over on the other side, on the, on the image on the, on, the, on the right. And here's my scapular spine right here. So this is posterior. Okay, posterior. Here's my inferior angle. Okay, here's my lateral border sitting right here. Here's my medial border. So the vertebrae are over here, arms out here. Okay, here's that scapular spine that comes up this way, and here's the acromion. Acromion X marks a spot for the acromion. You can see here's a scapular notch sitting right in there. Superior angle, superior border. Okay, and you can actually see the coracoid process how it comes out from the, from going anteriorly, okay? The glenoid fossa is gonna be right in this way underneath there. Here's my infraspinous fossa here. Here's my supraspinous fossa, and that's filled with the supraspinatus here, infraspinatus right here, and the teres minor up in that area, okay? And that's just showing you what the bone would actually look like. And again, you can actually get a good view here. If you look at the, at the scapula right here, see if you look in, in, in this area, see how thin it looks like right in here? looks very, very thin. You know why? Because it's very, very thin. It's a very thin muscle. It sometimes gets fractured, but it's not commonly fractured. You think a muscle that, that or excuse me, a bone that's that thin, it should be fractured much more commonly, but guess what? It's not. And the reason why it's not is it's so enveloped. It's so wrapped up with the muscle, with the subscapularis on the anterior side, the infraspinatus and the uh, uh, um, uh, uh, teres minor below the spine on the posterior side, the supraspinatus above the spine on the posterior side. It's really encased in this muscle. So it's actually really quite well protected. Okay, so that's just looking at the scapula uh, osseous wise. Okay, now if we're looking at the x-ray, the scapula is interesting. Um, and the reason why it's interesting is basically you see a very faint shadow. Now, a couple things about radiographs. Let me tell you a little about radiographs, and this is going to be coming time and time again. I probably mentioned it before, but I think it's worthwhile mentioning. When we look at a radiograph, a radiograph is very shades of the blackest black to the whitest white, okay? White on a typical radiograph means that it's very dense. The denser something is, basically the, the more compact, the harder, the denser it is, the whiter it's going to be.
the blacker it's going to be is going to be the less dense so therefore if you look out on here this is all air you know <laughs> there's not there's not much density at all so what happens is when we look at a radiograph the bad part about radiographs is they have what's called super imposition super imposition superimposition and superimposition means that something sits on top of something else which means that the densities are additive okay if I have something that's very dense sitting on something that's very dense it's going to be really really doubly dense at that point just makes sense so when we look at an x-ray an x-ray is a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional object you always have to remember that things are going to be in layers so we have to take that into consideration you know if I'm looking up here here's the head of the humerus sitting right there but we also see behind it some of that scapula okay here's the coracoid process that we can see here's that clavicle that we talked about before here's the acromion sitting right there okay and and so so what happens is, is we see an overlapping I can't see much of that of that media of that medial border of the scapula because it's very very thin okay not very dense if I look at the ribs the ribs look really dense out here but you know why I'm going through the rib through, I'm going here I'm, I'm going across a rib here I'm going through the ribs in other words I'm going along with that rib so therefore I have a lot more rib hanging you know like it's like in, instead of taking that when I look at the rib out here instead of having an x-ray coming like you know this way through an object it's actually going this way which means that it's gonna be a lot more dense over on the sides okay so anyway that's just looking at a typical normal show here's the humerus as we can see right here but let's go a couple more okay now this is interesting this is a scapular view okay and what I'm gonna point out the scapula here here's the body of the scapula coming down this way Here's that inferior angle right down here. Okay. Here's the scapular spine right there. Here's the superior portion. Here's the coracoid up in here. This area is the coracoid. Here's the rest of the body of the scapula coming like that. And here's a good old friend, the acromion coming up in here. So here's the acromion up in there. Here's the coracoid process right there. Here's the body of the scapula, inferior angle. Now, interesting thing, this is a, a not, not uncommon view for people to get when they're looking for a shoulder dislocation. And why? Here's the scapula. And you see what it looks like? It's a, it's a Y. It's a Y shape. If they get this image correctly, because there's a right angle that you have to take it, if you get that image correctly, here's the head of the humerus sitting right here. And the Y is in the center of the humerus, the humeral head. And if that if that humeral head, if that if that Y of the of the scapula is not in the center of the humeral head, something's wrong. It means that the humerus is a little bit out of place. It's out, it's dislocated. Here are some ribs just to show you the ribs. We'll talk more about ribs later on. Let's look at an, let's look at the humerus now. Okay, and we'll we'll see a lot more X-rays as time comes on. We got a lot more when we put this all together. Let's talk about the humerus. The 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 the, the proximal portion of the humerus is called the humeral head. Okay. Now, the head is this area in here. This area right here, the round area up at the top, is called the head. Here's the head right here. Okay. What happens is right at this point, right here and right here, is where I'm going to have that growth plate. Which means that this, this area right here is called the anatomical neck. The purple area is called the anatomical neck. Okay. This area down here and right here is called the surgical neck surgical neck uh, and the reason why it's surgical neck is because if they if they wanted to do something they don't want to go through the growth plate you know it's better to go here why that's also good cancellous bone what did I say about cancellous bone very bloody potential for healing is great okay so anyway that's just a little bit about that about that about the head of the humerus let me get rid of that stuff okay because there's other stuff I need to show you here now if I look at the humerus okay if I looking at at what we what we have here okay and let me just orient you this is looking from behind that's a posterior view this is looking from the front this is an anterior view forget about this for now forget about this let's just just get rid of this here for now we're not gonna talk but this is this is posterior and this is an anterior view okay so what happens is if I look at this okay and let's look at the anterior view first of all what happens is there's a bump right here and that's called the greater tubercle the greater tubercle then I have a little smaller bump right here and that's called the lesser tubercle so when we have two bumps and one's bigger and one's smaller, one's going to be greater, the bigger one, and one's going to be lesser, the smaller one. 
Now, what happens is when I have those two bumps, okay, if you look at it, right down the middle, there's a groove, groove right between. It's like two mountains, like the, you know, like the Grand Tetons, you got the mountains like this, and then there's a groove. Well, that little groove is like this groove that's right here, okay? And that's called the intertubercular groove. Inter means between. Between what? Two tubercles. That's where they get the word intertubercular. And sometimes it's called the bicipital groove. Now, I mentioned that the coracoid process is a place of attachment for the short head of the biceps. If there's a short head, guess what there is also? Of course, there's a long head. That long head of the biceps comes up this way and goes up and attaches right to the top of the glenoid right to the top corner of that glenoid fossa that we saw in a previous previous uh, uh, slide, okay? So anyway, what we have here is we have our head, we have our anatomical and surgical neck we know, we know the greater tubercle, we know the lesser tubercle, we know that intertubercular or bicipital groove, okay? And then sometimes it's hard to see, but down in here, you know, you can't see it here from behind very well. It would be here on a little bit more on the side. It's called the deltoid tuberosity. The deltoid's a very triangular shaped muscle that, that covers over the whole, you know, comes from the clavicle here and also the, the inferior border of the of the spine of the scapula. It comes down to the sh to the arm, you know, about here, you know, partway down, about a third of the way to, to almost a halfway down the humerus. And it's also an abductor. It pulls the arm out, okay? And there's a little bump there and that little bump is for the attachment of the deltoid, okay? Let's look at this a little bit closer closer, okay, and go over this a second time, so now it's going to be even better for you, because you could look at it now a little bit closer, okay, again, if I'm looking, here's the head, here's the anatomical neck, right there, let me go back here, here's the head, here's the anatomical neck right there, and that's where the growth plate would be, here's the surgical neck going in this way, surgical neck going in that way, Here's the greater tubercle right here. Here's the lesser tubercle sitting right there. And then between the two, between the, the two uh, uh, tubercles, is that intertubercular sulcus coming right down through there for that bice or that bicipital groove. Okay, so that's what we see. We're actually seeing the greater tubercle here because we only see it in a silhouette from behind. So we can't see the lesser because the lesser the lesser tubercle is really more anterior, where the greater tubercle is a little bit more anterior lateral. Okay, if you could think about it that way, anterior lateral. The glenoid fossa would be sitting right here. The glenoid fossa would be sitting right there. Okay. Let's look at some uh, x-rays here to give you a little, a little bit better idea as to where we are, okay? And I'll go ahead and annotate these as we go. Here's the glenoid fossa, you see it right there? Okay, that's the glenoid right there. We're starting to see the, the scapula there. Uh, here's the coracoid, see that little bump right there? That's the coracoid sitting right there, okay? Here's the acromion up over the top, okay? Here's the clavicle, here's the clavicle, okay? Sitting right there, it's flat. So the acromion, again, sitting up in here, acromion sitting here. So therefore, this right here would be the acromial clavicular joint that's sitting right there, okay? Here's the head of the humerus. So the head would be sitting right in there. The, uh, the anatomical neck would be right about in there. Surgical neck would be sitting down in here. You can't see, it says you can see the bicipital groove, but this x-ray, you can't see it a whole lot, okay? But that's what we see. And let me just get rid of this. You can see a little bit, a little little sort of like a, a faint shadow of where that groove would be right there. But I mean, you know, that's, you got you to use your imagination, I think, for that a little bit more. I think there's some x-rays that show it a little bit more than, a little bit better than that. So that's what we should see. I think you should be, so on this, you definitely should be able to pick out the acromion. You should be able to pick out the greater tubercle because you can actually see it bump out there. You could actually see the lesser tubercle would be this area right here. See a little, sh the little shadow right there let me get rid of that okay if you could actually look right here there's a little white line you see right at the tip of the arrow there's a little white faint line that's the area of the lesser tubercle and that we know that that bicipital groove or that that intertubercular sulcus could be sitting right between it right there okay surgical neck we should know I uh, should know where the bicipital groove is about. We should know where the anatomical neck, we should be able to identify the clavicle. We should be able to identify the scapula. Those are easy pictures, okay? This is better. Ooh, I love it, okay? Um, let's look at this a little bit better, okay? And this shows a lot more, okay? And this is a, this is a, a really good image. What's this right here? Let's see if you know. 
Obviously, it's chromium, okay? You should have known that, okay? What's this right here? You should be saying it. Let me hear it. I can't hear it. I still can't hear it. Oh, yeah, that's right. I can't hear you. It's a video. That's the, that's the glenoid fossil, okay? And see how, see how very mildly concave it is? Not really deep. It's made deeper by that labrum, that cartilage that sits up around the outside that deepens it. Here's the coracoid. You can actually see the coracoid process right here, okay? What do we see in the humerus? Here's the head of the humerus right there, okay? The anatomical neck would be right across there. In fact, if you look, okay, if you really look, see how, if you look really, and see how this is a little bit, see the whiter areas in here, you know? That's the remnant of the old growth plate that divides the, the, the head from the, the, the neck region, okay? So that's the area right in here would be the area of the anatomical neck. Surgical neck would be down in down in here. I don't want to draw it too low because I don't want to. Sh I really want to be able to show you something else. Here's the greater tubercle right there. Let's get rid of that surgical neck. There's the greater tubercle. Here's the lesser tubercle right there, that little white line, and that in between that is the intertubercular sulcus, which is right in here. Okay. Now you haven't looked at X-rays a whole lot, so it's sort of like trying to get used to this and orient yourself. Okay. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to erase this, okay? And everybody knows where everything is. Now, I want you to look at it. Now, you have to sort of, you know, and one of the things about someone who's dealing with x-rays, being able to look at that two-dimensional object and get a three-dimensional picture in their mind, okay? And, and you could see where these lumps and bumps are. And you could sort of, if you know what the bone looks like from a previous image, you should be able to figure out what you see here, okay? It should be pretty simple, okay? So, Give you another couple seconds to look at that. If you want, you could stop it and stop the video and you could look at and try to identify everything that's there, okay? Here's another one, okay? And this is that scapular view. And actually what we what we still see here is here's the head of the humerus coming up in here. Here's the scapula coming here, that Y. And if you look, again, that Y is in the middle of the, of the, head, of the head of the humerus. Here's the acromion. You can see the clavicle right here? You know, actually the clavicle is coming out to here, and this area right here would be the acromioclavicular joint. See the coracoid process quite prominently there. You should be now starting to look at these things to understand them a little bit more. The more x-rays you look at, the better off you're going to be, okay? Now let's just go over to the one over, over here, okay? Here's the acromion, you know, here's the clavicle, here's the acromioclavicular joint should be right in there. Here's the body of the scapula coming here. Here's that Y, but here's the head. Hmm. It looks to me like that head is a little bit too low and a little bit too medial, probably dislocation. Okay. Also, by the position, the arm tells me a little bit something as well. So that's not a good view. This is another one, and this is a very good, very good picture. Okay. Something that we see again, and here's the here's the head. Okay. Anatomical neck would be right there. Surgical neck is going to be right there. Here's the glenoid right in here. It's rotated around a little bit more. So actually, you know, you can see it a little bit more. Okay. Here's the coracoid process. Here's the acromion, which is in the end of the spine of the scapula. Okay. Here, I'm using black, that's, that's stupid. Here's the clavicle. Here's the acromioclavicular joint, a, called the AC joint. Okay, so that pretty much shows what you see here. And then, here's my greater tubercle. Here's my lesser tubercle. And between the two is right there is that intertubercular sulcus, intertubercular sulcus. Okay, now look at the body of the, of the, of the, of the scapula. You can't see it a whole lot. You see this little shadow? Here, you can actually see it up in here. You can follow it down. You can follow it down this way. Here's the inferior angle, but see how faint it is? Very, very thin bone. Here's that medial border. You really have to look close, you know, because they're not really looking at the densities of the scapula. They're looking at the densities of this area out in here, more likely, okay, to look for anything that might be might be crazy that's going on out there, okay? Again, this is just another looking at, here's a surgical neck. Here's the glenoid cavity. Here's the coracoid, a chromion clavicle, a chromial clavicular joint would be right there. Pretty much what we saw. Here's the here's the lateral board of the scapula. You actually see the medial board of the scapula sitting right there, inferior angle. Okay? And if you didn't see those, 
now you can okay this is just another view that just shows the same thing that we showed before except somebody else drew drew on it instead of me okay so you can go back and look at this one you should be able to identify all these i should i should be able to put this on a quiz and you should be able to identify every one of those things now i bring this one in because it's insignificant because it, we say what in the world happened what in the world happened now in an earlier lecture okay an earlier powerpoint video we talked about how we have centers of oscillation and this is a kid okay and this is a kid here's the humerus okay if i look here here's the humerus okay here's here's the area where the head of the humerus see a little dot up there let me get rid of that see there's a little density okay i'm gonna, I'm gonna just i'm just gonna draw an arrow to it okay it's a little density right there that's the head of the humerus it's starting to ossify it's a secondary center of ossification and if i look down here see that little dot right there at the end of that arrow there's another little faint circle ovoid there that's the that's the distal end of the humor part or part of the distal end of the humerus starting to show up okay called the capitulum it's starting to show up at that point and this is i brought this in simply because <clears throat> this is what we see the bones not all there this is and if this is the radius right here when the forearm bones and i don't see it this is a big gap in there that's not the way it normally is why yes there's bone there but it's in the cartilage form right now in that enchondral or endochondral ossification if you haven't looked at that video make sure you go back and look at that video because that's going to tell you a little about these ossification centers so basically what happens is if you look here it says the humerus the head the greater and the lesser tuberosities fuse together you know about uh, four to six years of age and they fuse the shaft in the male about uh, uh, nine, 19 to 21 years and females always a little bit earlier females females are always bigger to start out with and then guys catch up and they get taller later on I don't know what happened to me but happens is uh and that's because uh they, the growth plates become a little bit more active earlier in, in girls but then they fuse sooner and when they fuse sooner that they stop growing where the guys continue to grow for a little bit after a while after i you know i guess you know they finally if if it's a race they win the race later on but i mean because they went a little bit further but that's about it but we have secondary centers of ossification so this is this is the primary center and this up here would be a secondary center it should also be a secondary center down in here okay i just want to bring that in because in, and and in, in this the and in, in, in there, there's a book that shows all these when all these bones start to show up you know what to please don't memorize don't sit around and stick you know take 10 or 12 hours to memorize when these are i want you to recognize that things occur at different ages okay things start to show up radiographically that's not your job but what happens is somebody's going to look and they want to chronologically know how old the bone is they could look for these secondary centers of ossification if they're there that means that they're at least past a certain age. If they're not there, it usually means that they're before that certain age when they start to appear. There'll, there'll, there'll be an age when it starts to appear and an age when it fuses to the other part of the bone. Okay, and those are all on charts. But that's just look at ossification closures, as it says up in here. Okay, again another juvenile shoulder, and again you see the the humerus, the shaft, and you see the head of the humerus. Again, that secondary ossification center right in there and then you see down in here this area is called the capitulum and you start to see that as well that's the distal portion of the humerus it's starting to show up there you don't see all, you don't see much of the acromion the acromion should be some here clavicles only out to there you know so what we've talked about in this video is we've talked about the shoulder girdle we've talked about the clavicle s-shaped bone curves from uh anterior medial uh it, it, it progresses laterally and in the middle portion it starts to go posterior and lateral to attach this to the to the acromion we know it's more tubular where it's closer to the sternum what happens when i finally get to the area of the of the uh, acromion which is part of the scapula it flattens out uh interestingly enough where it changes from where it starts to make that rounding to go posterior and where it changes from being rounder to flatter that's the place where most fractures of the clavicle occur and clavicular fractures are exceptionally common I mean like I say I, I uh, working hockey and lacrosse every season there was somebody that got a clavicular fracture and my actually my my older son when he was playing hockey uh, he was going from um, uh, let's see uh, squirt to peewee 
And Pee Wee, you could check, squirt, you can't check. So he was playing in a summer league, um, going from squirt to Pee Wee. And it was like his second game, okay? And he got taken. Some kid took him in the boards. It was a cheap shot, but took him in the boards. And he skated to the bench. He's holding his arm. He skated to the bench. And, you know, Dad's sitting in the, in the stands and saying, you yeah, know, Jason, come on. If you can't take a hit now, you know, wait till you get to get to high school. Um, and, you know, anyway, so then there, as soon as there's a whistle, he skates off the ice, goes to the locker room. Goes, so I go in the locker room and see what's going on with him. I said, Jason, what's wrong? He says, my shoulder hurts. I says, you know what? You're going to have a lot of bangs and, and, and bumps and bruises and stuff like that playing hockey. It's a, it's a contact game, you know? And I said, okay, get dressed and we'll, you know, we'll wait around at the end of the game and then we'll go to the, get something to eat. Anyway, I went to dinner, sitting at uh, like Denny's or something like that. And he keeps on playing around with his shoulder. And then so good old dad, he says, let me look at it. I pull his shoulder down there, his clavicle is going like this. I mean, geez, did dad feel really stupid? So I took him to my office, took an x-ray uh, on the x-ray machine I have in my office. I developed it. Sure enough, he has a clavicular fracture, mid, mid shaft of the clavicle, exactly where it's supposed to be. And... Um, Took him. I didn't have. A, I didn't have a splint, so I had to take him to the emergency room to get a splint. And they just they just splint the shoulders back. Clavicle heals really good. The thing about the clavicle is um, some of the fractures are really nasty. I've had some where they look like they're going to pop through the skin. Okay, they're actually part of it's angled up with a little spike, and the skin gets really stretched at that point. And basically, if you pull the shoulders back and you put them in a splint, what happens is clavicle, most bones you have to have about 80% contact end to end. Clavicle, you can sometimes even have them when they're overlapping like that at the end. And guess what? They heal. Somebody said that if you dropped a clavicle on the floor and you left it there long enough, it would probably fuse to the floor. I don't think that's probably right. OK, I wouldn't try it. Uh, but anyway, it, it's a it's a, a decently healing bone. We talked about the scapula. The scapula is a very thin bone, but very well protected because the muscles, both on the anterior and the posterior side, it has lots of little nooks and crannies, a supraspinous fossil with the supraspinous muscle. that's an abductor of the shoulder, it pulls the shoulder up. OK, one of the rotator cuff muscles on the front surface or the anterior surface, they, the subscapular fossa with the subscapulars, which internally rotates the shoulder. On the posterior surface, below the spine of the scapula, we have the infraspinous fossa and the teres minor, which are actually sort of blended, okay? And basically, they are external rotators as well of the shoulder. Um, we talked about how that, sc that scapular spine comes up and ends as it hooks forward at the acromion, and that's the area that meets the area of the, of the clavicle. We talked about the coracoid process, the little finger, which you can actually feel a quite tender area. You know, right, right in here in the front of the shoulder, you could actually. Hopefully, if you were able to feel it, okay. Please don't sue me if it if it was tender for you or anything like that. But what happens is that's that's a that sticks out both from muscular attachment as well as that ligament that holds the clavicle down. Uh, we talked about the angles and the glenoid fossa. The glenoid fossa actually very almost it's it's only minimally concave, but it's deepened by a labrum or a ring of cartilage that goes around the glenoid labrum, okay. Um, and then we talked about the humerus, the head of the humerus, the, the, the head of the humerus, the anatomical neck where the growth plate would have been. OK, uh, we talked about the surgical neck, which is back more in the metaphyseal region of bone, which is a word that you should know. OK, we talked about the uh, a greater and lesser uh, uh, tubercle OK, or tuberosity. And basically, this is these are those bumps. And, and that's where the um, that's the exact way place where the. Uh, 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 rotator muffle, muscles attached to it. I should have mentioned that. The, uh, the, the, the uh, lesser, okay, which is more medial, is where the subscapularis attaches to. The greater at the top is where the supraspinatus attaches to, and the greater at the posterior and lateral side is where the uh, infraspinatus and the teres minor are attached to. Okay, and again, because they're around the head of the humerus, and the humerus is round, it's able to rotate around, and that's the shoulder. So that's a little bit of an overview of the uh, shoulder girdle. Hopefully, you can go over this again, and I, I think I know these pretty well. Okay, so anyway. Well, uh, uh, if you have any questions, you could always uh, uh, email me, ask, or whatever the case may be, or at a, at a session we're together, you could always ask. Um, in the meantime, though, um, uh, stay safe and stay healthy.